At AIA Australia, we have the tools and support to help you grow your business. Available 24-7, our Business Growth Hub offers an online suite of resources such as marketing tools and help to build out your health and wellbeing proposition. If you're looking for a trusted business partner, chat to your AIA CDM today. And welcome to XY Live on the 10th of August. We've got uh, we've got David Boyer here from uh, SQL CFO. And he's also he's also uh, from the uh, part of the from the trenches uh, podcast, which is an accounting podcast um, uh, targeted at the accounting community. I'd encourage people to check it out. It's it's a really good perspective on what accountants find important. Important. What we're looking at today is actually um, how to engage uh, accountants for a, a profitable relationship. So um, Dave, David's worked with them for a number of years. He is one. Um, and he's going to give us insights. He's, he's, he's one of the guys that I've, I've seen actually advocate uh, wealth and um, financial advice as a channel for a lot of accountants to actually grow their businesses. So he's an advocate of financial advice, and uh, we welcome him here today. Thanks very much for having me. It's really exciting. Um, great community that you've, you guys have built. I've, I'm part of your Facebook group. I'm too scared to post because I'm not a financial planner, but... Uh, maybe I'll get a bit more comfort after this webinar. Well, mate, I, as I said, don't be scared. No one bites often. Oh. Um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll, how about you tell us a bit about your background and um, sort of what, um, what your experience has been over the last few years? So my, uh, I'm a chartered accountant. I'm a very proud chartered accountant. I'm the son of a chartered accountant. Um, I did my CA at a typical mid-tier accounting firm called Moore Stevens. Uh, and uh, bloody hated it. I, I hated doing numbers that were irrelevant. Um, they were old, the clients didn't value it. I, I didn't really enjoy being an accountant in practice, but I was there for seven years um, because it's just the skill that you need. you need. You need to understand how public practice works. You need to understand how accounts are put together. Um, and you know, overall, I'm, I'm very grateful for the, the skills that I got there. Um, got a tap on the shoulder from a recruiter, said, hey, do you want to be a business banker? Um, it's basically a business development role. You'll be writing deals and dealing with SME clients. It sounded glorious and the banks are really good at selling and um, joined NAB as a business banker for three years. Um, learned a massive amount about how big corporates communicate, cash flow. Um, and actually during that time, I sold wealth products. We had an MLC broker um, stationed in our business banking center. I was in Richmond in Melbourne and uh, I had a KPI about um, funds under management that I needed to sell to clients. Um, what are the ethics of that? I, I didn't do very well at it. I found it really hard to sell actually. Um, so I don't envy you guys. Um, but that was sort of my experience, I guess, in, in having dealing with brokers um, or, or wealth advisors. Um, I then had one client who wanted to do a debt restructure and I couldn't do it. And I told them why. And they came back three months later and all of the things that needed to happen had happened. And I said, how, how did you do this? And I've got a virtual CFO. Do you want to meet him? And this was 2013, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe 2013, 2012. And I thought, what on earth is a virtual set? Like, what is this? I, I've never heard of this before. And I was just blown away and said, I want to do this. I want to help. Every single one of my clients needed this. So I went and uh, worked for Mawson Group. And I'm one of the few people actually worked as a virtual CFO. Um, and then left Mawson because I, probably like a lot of guys in this group, just always wanted to go out on my own and start my own business. Um, worked in a co-working space with a bloke called Paul Meisner and who was an accountant. And there's a phrase in the accounting industry at the moment that everyone needs to understand, which is compliance is dead. You have to do advisory work. And Paul is a pure compliance practice and I'm a pure advisory practice. Paul thinks compliance isn't dead. So do I, I think that you don't have to do advisory, which is where I've advocated for accountants doing things like wealth. Um, we sort of dated for a little bit, realized we got in common, we had a lot in common. And I said, mate, do you want to start a podcast? And that was the birth of From the Trenches, real life in the accounting industry. Yeah, they're a bit like, they're a bit like XY advisor for accountants. Oh, I, I, well, we don't have an online community as active as yours, mate. But I think definitely that voice of reason where you've got people who are living, breathing, trying to keep up with the changing economy and environment that we're working in discussing the issues rather than letting software vendors or self-interest groups control the public debate about what's happening in our industries. We should be controlling that debate. We're the ones who are working in it. It affects us most and we're the ones having the conversations with the customer. Yeah, 
Yeah, love it, Dave. Love it. Well, what's what's um, like a big thing? A lot of advisors don't have accounting relationships. A lot do. Um, for the ones that don't, what what's the opportunity? Um, so um, I'll go through some of the tools in accounting at the moment, which is whether or not you believe that compliance is here to stay or it's going. Um, it is under pressure. Enough. There's either more of it, you need to work more efficiently. Uh, maybe you're not doing a great job of it. You, you might be under fee uh, pressure, price pressure, which is, I think that's spoken about more than actually happens. But throughout all of the disruption that's happened in our industry through, basically because of zero, the accounting software zero. Um, and, and obviously the, the former zero Australian head, uh, Chris Ridd's now gone to My Prosperity, which is a wealth tool, which I'm sure uh, I, I expect would have been discussion in your Facebook group and maybe some people. Yeah, have, definitely. Um, uh, and, and many people probably have relationships with Mina who, who's doing a great job promoting it. Um, that, that changed the way our business worked. It, it was a fundamental change and it caused a lot of people. Zero came out and said, it's going to be quicker to do compliance. You need to do something else. You should do advisory. The conversations changed to more, um, how are you going to grow your firm? And one of the things that's really coming up is the idea of the diversified firm, a firm that has your typical business services, tax compliance, family trust accounts, all the stuff that you, know, you probably go to your accountant for. Um, but then also what are the other service lines? And there are three main broad categories, um, compliance advisory. So actually charging for what we used, used to call customer service. You know, um, I've got to buy my son a car. What entity do I buy it in? Um, I need to pay 20 grand in school fees. Can the business afford it? That, that sort of stuff, which is just, it's a mainly, it's compliant based. It's how to use tax to, to build your wealth. Um, there's performance advisory, which is really what virtual CFO is. It's we, we get into a business and we tear it apart and we make it more profitable or we fix its cash flow or, or whatever its issues are, or we get into it. And then I, I think the other major one is wealth advisory. And I talk about this a lot on the podcast. Um, accountantsdaily.com.au um, regularly quotes one of my quotes where I said, it's, it's nauseating the, the conversation. There's a thousand things that accountants can do and wealth management's one of them. And one of the major changes in wealth management, I, tell me, interrupt me if I'm talking too much, is um, uh, it's lifestyle good. change. You know, accountants used to do wealth advisory and, irrespective of whatever licensing was allowed. Um, and that's caused disruption and opportunity because in my opinion, um, wealth advisory is the most natural thing for accountants to do. It suits the personality type and it is, it is pure trusted advisor uh, type services. Um, and I, I think it's a, a massive, I really think it's a golden age of accountants are about to come. Um, and I think the opportunity is to part, find a way to partner with accountants to provide more value to their clients in a very safe and secure and trustworthy. And I really emphasize trustworthy way. Yeah. So, um, and what have you, what ways have you seen it done well? Like what have, yeah, uh, <laughs> probably uh, the most common way is that an accounting firm would actually just, just bring in a wealth book. They will buy a wealth business and bring it under their banner and, and try to roll it out into um, their client base. Um, that's really common. And I, and I actually think that's really profitable for both parties because you're not buying leads, you're buying a 20 year relationship the accountant has with someone who needs a wealth problem. Now, not everyone wants to sell their business and that's fine. And the reality is 90 something, it's a stupid number. And I wish Paul was here because he knows this off the back of his hand. Something like 80% of accountants are sole practitioners. So, so probably like the people listening to this show, um, single partner firms, maybe they've got an offsider, maybe they've got an admin person, but they're kind of trying to do it all themselves. Um, but they all have great clients. Like they've got a dozen top tier clients. They've got 40, 50 mid tier clients and they've got the stragglers. You know, the average accountant has about 120 relationships. So th there needs to be a way to replicate that bigger firm buying a wealth division um, for those other businesses that want to offer that sort of service to the client. And whether or not it's, it's profitable as in clipping the ticket or not will be defined by the relationship that you form. With you, you said the eighty percent is like small practitioners. You're telling me the numbers. Yeah, you're telling me the numbers actually about how big this pie is and how many accountants are out there. Like, and they were pretty mind-boggling. What 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 are the numbers for the people that aren't aware of how big the accounting industry is? 
Well, CPA is under a lot of fire. Alex Malley sort of lied about the CPA numbers, but there's about 160,000 CPAs and about 140,000 chartered accountants. So, so there's 300,000 accountants. Now, not all of them are out in practice, but the majority are accountants in practice. So there might be a couple of hundred thousand, literally. Now, some of them, let's take out the big firms, the big employers, your big four, your mid-tiers. There, there's literally tens and tens of thousands of sole practitioner accounting firms in the marketplace. And let's talk about the mindset of them. They are not at ZeroCon. They are not at the Accounting Business Expo in Sydney where I had a stall and stole these posters that you can see behind because I thought they were really cool and everyone was leaving and packing up and, and me and my team took them down and tried to smuggle them out of the exhibition centre you've got in Darling Harbour there in torrential Sydney humidity rain, which was lovely. Um, <laughs> The, the, so so the, the average accountant is not what you read about online or what you see at the big, sexy, exciting accounting conferences. The average accountant sitting out in the suburbs just working his or her butt off trying to get their clients up to date. And in terms of like how many of those guys actually want to have this opportunity with an advisor? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. And that's, that's, I think, the, the challenge for everybody listening is understanding who they're building, who you're building a referral partnership with and if they want what you solve. Um, what you do does not solve, if it doesn't solve a problem for an accounting, if it doesn't give them a gain or if it doesn't help them do a job, don't waste your time talking to them, move on. And don't, don't feel insulted by that. Accountants are unbelievably busy people and you're going to hate me, I'm going to say it, Accountants are busier than, than wealth advisors. But here's why. Here's why. We all have customer demands and we're all really, really busy. We're all really, really oh. busy. Work ethic is not a challenge for, for either of our professions. Accountants have this additional overlay called the Tax Office Compliance Program, which is a deadline and timeline of lodgements that absolutely have to be made. And if the accountant misses their deadlines, they potentially put their clients at risk. So you don't only have hey, I need to meet with my client, that keeps me busy. You've also got, hey, I need to meet this compliance deadline and there's, no, there's not much wriggle room in it, which, which forces unbelievably high pressure workloads at key periods of time. We can all extend a deadline and maybe disappoint a client. Mm. We can create time for ourselves, but the tax office is one, one part of the accountant business that, that doesn't exist in the wealth business. And actually, it's funny, I just did a podcast with an accounting coach and uh, we were talking about how accountants, and I think some listeners may have experienced this, you, you might feel that accountants look down on wealth advisors. Um, and he mentioned this in the podcast. And then he said, well, if you said to accountants, if you didn't have the God-given right that legally your customer has to come to you every year to get their tax return done, you'd probably be in exactly the same position as a wealth advisor would be, where you have to service your client, grind to find your fees, over service so you keep them work hard for referrals and so i think we're actually cut from the same cloth we just have this tax office thing on our on our backs um mm. it's a bit, of a, a bit of a pro and a con it's two sides of the coin there yeah yeah that's right well in terms of while we're, while we're on that tax office piece what, what are the best times of the year to actually engage with an accountant so they'll actually have time or want to talk to you <laughs> have yeah, a chance of yeah. talking to them yeah, the, the quietest time of year for accountants is actually 30 June, or 1 July. 1 yeah. July, up until probably the end of August, all of our, the clients, like they're finishing their year end, like the CFOs are busy. The CFOs or, or the bookkeepers are trying to work out, well, how, how are we going to end this year? And then it's sort of the end of August where the workload starts to come in to, to get end of year uh, tax returns done. So that it starts to build up. You know, I don't know about Sydney, but in Melbourne, from Melbourne Cup until about the 14th of January, not much happens in Melbourne. Like the Melbourne Cup's the start of summer for us, even if it's raining. Um, <laughs> accountants are always busy, but, but that period after year end is really good. And then you gotta understand the BAS cycle. BAS's can take up a lot of workload um, and they're usually due 28 days after quarter end as a general rule. Mm. So that's not a good time to try to hit up an accountant to find a strategic partnership. Um, and while I'm on that, can I chuck another tip in there? Is that all right? But, and, and, and really I love to tips. Everyone is trying to use accountants as a channel to market, especially now more than ever because of the zero out on marketplace. It's really common that 
a lot of people are trying to get to accountants, customer bases, and your a wealth advisor is unfortunately another person in that queue. So um, understand that it's a, it's a noisy space and try to find the point of difference that you offer that really helps with those things that I spoke about um, being, and you can write these down, what do you do that creates a win for them? What do you do that alleviates a problem? Regulation is probably a big, big thing. Um, and then what can you do that helps them get jobs done um, in, a, in a better way? And if you can articulate that, then you add value to the accountant. I promise you, if you go to an accountant and say, hey, I'm a wealth advisor, I'm young, exciting, energetic, I'm different to everybody else. I wasn't part of the, you know, I guess the, the CBA scandal from a couple of years ago, hopefully not the CBA scandal now. Um, the, you know, can I have a referral? Do you know how many times accountants get, up, get pitched that? Can I have a referral? Like it's, you're not going to get it. Um, tell me what you can do for me. Tell me what you can do for my clients. Um, I can tell you my business now. So I... Um, at Mawson Group, we got referrals from accountants. As a banker, I got referrals from accountants. Right now, 80% of my clients are referrals from accountants. And a major reason that that's working is I don't do any tax and compliance. So I go to them and I say, I've got clients. I don't do what you do and I need somebody to do what you do. So can I give you this fee? Um, when I'm in the client, I encourage the accountant to come for at least a quarterly sort of board meeting. So I'm kind of selling the accountant in to have more face time with their clients. And so because I'm giving something, it's easier for me to build a relationship. And mm. I think that approach is really important. You've got to work out what you offer an accountant rather than just saying, hey, you got a ton of clients and I like your clients, give me some fees. And I'm not suggesting that everybody does that. I, I, I'm sure people do a considered approach, but I can tell you that is the average pitch to accountants. Well, Dylan, Dylan's just asked, um, he wants to write those down and he missed, missed those three things that you mentioned before. Well, right, we're, uh, we've got a very special offer for XY Advisor listeners. Um, after this, I'm going to post a link in, in Facebook group. I've put together a little worksheet just for XY guys on understanding how to use those three things. So it's, it's a derivation of a tool called the Value Proposition Canvas, which I'm a huge advocate of. And uh, what we try to do is understand what you do, we'll understand the particular accountant and understand what you do that can alleviate those three things. So we'll post that link up uh, afterwards so you don't need to take notes, mate. It's a nice little worksheet uh, that you can work through. And uh, Adrian kindly corrected the spelling errors that I've put on it. I'm a numbers guy, let's be, let's be honest. <laughs> oh, everyone loves free stuff in XY Advisor, so that'll be good. <laughs> I, I, I want to know what, what are the mistakes? Like you've seen, like obviously people... Um, what, are, what are ways people go about the wrong way? Obviously, um, asking for referrals. Is there anything else that's sort of a bit taboo or just really not a good way to go about it in terms of... Yeah, don't, don't insult us. <laughs> I, I've actually... I know the wealth advisor whose opening pitch was, hey, Mr. Accountant, you've been breaking the law for five years now because you're not regulated, so you should use me. Believe it or not, there's actually a lot of accountants who, who are flaunting... Um, the new regulation rules. There's articles on Accountants Daily that the, the number of accountants that have actually registered for the new limited licensing advice is really, really low. And they're flaunting it because they're like, well, I've got 30 years experience. I've had my customer for 20 years. Well, what are you going to do? Um, mm. Which is good, but the, the, a lot of accountants are doing it. So don't insult them. Don't. And what that's done is you have assumed that for that particular accountant, that new regulation is a problem needs to be alleviated for them. And I encourage that this worksheet that we're going to post, don't just do a blanket one for every accountant. Try to understand a target that you want to have a relationship with and find out about that firm and what they do and who their customers are. Are there customers who you want your customers to be? Because a lot of, like I'll take my dad's firm. He's had his clients for 30 years. They are never, ever going to move their businesses to the cloud, which means I can never, ever work with them. It's a waste of my time trying to get a referral off my dad's business um, because it's just not going to happen. And I know that. So I don't try, I don't actually solve a problem for him or his clients. There's no point in me, me trying to pitch there. So I think understand, and you guys know, understand who the accountant's client is and understand if that's your client, step one, because straight away you're going to hit it off. You're going to talk about the cycles of your client, the life stages of your client, what they're looking for, hopes, wants, dreams, all that sort of stuff that you all get taught in sales one. 
um, and then understand from an accountant's point of view, what are they struggling with with, with servicing that client? And, and every accountant will be a little bit different. Yeah, awesome. I think everyone's um, enjoying these these tips. And I encourage everyone to ask a few more questions. Ben's going to jump in with a few questions. But if anyone's been thinking um, anything in particular, get specific if you want to. David, he's pretty flexible. He's got he likes he likes talking. So um, yeah, give him an opportunity. Yeah. Right. <laughs> David, I've just got a question from uh, Craig, who's who's watching in. You're referring to you know, you want to uh, make sure that when an advisor is trying to partner with an accountant that they're, that they're solving problems for the accountant. So, yeah. you know, the question is, what are three things that, um, that, a, that an advisor could help you with that would make your life easier? And perhaps you might be able to talk a bit more broadly about the three, you know, or, or some of the common challenges facing accountants at the moment. Yeah, so I think... Um I think regulation is one, um, whether or not an accountant wants to fork with it or not, it, it's definitely something. Um, the second is just general firm growth. How does the accountant want to grow the firm um, and do they want wealth at all? Um, building a wealth practice from scratch is, is like, as you guys all know, because you're all doing it, it's not easy. Um, everything from understanding regulation to the practice management of a wealth business is not the same as a practice management of an accounting business. Um, and then being able to streamline that back office piece as well is very different for accountants. So maybe be just offering being able to streamline the back office of wealth could be something that, excuse me, that you could do. Um, uh, so they're sort of, so, so I guess, some of the pains that, that you could deal with. You could offer a shortcut way to bring wealth into the business. Um, you could offer a solution to the regulation environment that accountants are sitting in at the moment. Or um, another pain reliever might be, um, you know, that the accountant just doesn't know how to grow their business. And you actually go and you pitch them and you say, hey, a wealth partnership is a way for you to grow. But if you, if you want to do that, you need to find a way to financially remunerate them. Otherwise, they're not actually growing. Um, the flip side of that is you will find accountants who just want to service their clients well. And it's not about flipping the ticket. Um, so what you're helping them gain there is a better trusted relationship with their client because they've introduced a quality um, advisor into the mix. And I'll give you an example. I started, when I started the business, I tried to get a referral off an accounting firm on St Kilda Road in Melbourne. And after like five meetings, this was before I knew all of this stuff about understanding that you've got to give and solve something before you, before you pitch. I was just asking for referrals. I was one of the, the, the guys who I just made fun yeah. of. And he goes to me, David, you know what I've worked out after 30 years in practice? I was like, all oh, right, right, this will be good. Uh, I'm in the customer retention business. And I thought, what are you talking? This particular accountant had his relationships with his clients for a long time and all he wanted to do was keep them. And for him, referring other people in was just a risk. He, he, he didn't want to do it and I was wasting my time with him. So there will be accountants though who do view strengthening the trusted relationship with their client as being important. And a way of doing that is through building a network of advisors that they can introduce in. And you as the financial planner help them achieve that gain by being part of that, that network and the wealth solution for them. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, and just to follow up on what your comment before about that, you mentioned you, you do a bit in the wealth space. What does that look like? Is that just if you've got the licensing around no, that, or no? I don't. No. I don't do. I don't do any wealth. Okay. When, when I was so a when you were... banker, I had to sell. I had sales targets for MLC oh, okay. management. Yeah, and so for accountants that, that do wealth, it, it's the that well to do it, you know, and, and comply with the regulation. It's that um, you're referring to them just getting getting the licensing and being doing that the same way that an advisor would. Yeah, and I think some of the work that Adrian's doing around this is is absolutely fantastic. In particular, um, you know, identifying that that information problem needs to be fixed, and you know, and Adrian, you're working on a solution to help that for accountants. But you know, I say working on a solution. You've made a decision to work in your business to develop IP to solve that particular problem for an accountant. And it's not just a sales pitch. You actually have to back it up with, with what you've got and how you work. Accountants are pretty. Uh, they got a tight sniff test. They're not marketed too easily. 
Yeah, I can, I can vouch for that. Jeez, I was, I was singing with one this morning actually before before we came on, and um, it was a great it was a great discussion because this guy had worked in financial advice, uh, and, and he sort of in a in a practice that had accounting and advice, and he got um, so he had a good perception of financial advice, which is which is really good. Um, but he was still having these problems that you're talking about. Like it's still, it doesn't matter how much they like advice, they've still got their business problems. And if you don't fix those, then you're not going to get to those next stages. Yeah. Yeah. Should I just keep going? (laughs) (laughs) I can keep going. (laughs) We're actually... We're working on that. The digital tap on the shoulder. Uh, 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 I've got a quick one for you. Um, Because I, like I see in my business, like my advice business, we work with a lot of um, PAYG people. Um, Not, not so many business owners. And uh, that's due to the sorts of, you know, we do a lot of coaching and, um, and those sorts of services, which are uh, more complicated for, for business owners. So we sort of stay away from it. Um, one thing is I've noticed that a lot of uh, accountants are uh, moving away from that, obviously because of the fact that, you know, if you look at fees for uh, individuals versus fees for businesses, it's hard for, you know, accountants to add heaps of value to individuals to justify the sorts of fees that they need to do to keep their businesses going. But um, what are you seeing? Because you obviously see a lot of what's happening in, in the industry is what are your views on that? And, and do you think is that, is that sort of dying, the, the, the tax advice for individuals? Uh, it's not dying, it's specialising. So um, there are firms that are, you can't make money on individuals unless you do it at scale. And your yeah. process is just so ironclad. You know, an individual goes to an accountant, they, they're literally paying for every extra deduction that they want to claim on their tax return because that accountant's just broken up the process so fine um and so you've got i mean the classic example is h and r block doing a pop-up store in westfield around tax time offering 99 dollar i returns like that's what you're competing with you're never gonna you're never gonna be cheaper than that ever and you'll never make money off 99 dollar i returns income tax return for, for an individual so it's becoming that part of it is at risk of commoditization and i'll give you a really cool example my office is in St Kilda in Melbourne, so it's sort of the hipster part of the south. So your, your beard will do really well down here, mate. Uh, mine's <laughs> just like you look like an accountant, you know? Average, uh, yeah, yeah, just average. <laughs> but it, it is a bit of the hipster area in the south part of Melbourne. I'm just on Barclay Street, and across the road there's there's billboard posters, and like you know, there's one up for Splendour in the Grass, which I went to this year. It was I think I was the only accountant there. It was good fun. Um, a bunch of <laughs> <laughs> um, the, you know, there's, there's sponsors, there's posters for gigs and there's this poster for this thing called air tax. Now I, I'd seen it before. I couldn't remember what it is. Air tax is the completely automated income tax return and Baz lodgements, economy workers underwritten by PwC and NAB. So if you're an Uber driver, if you're a delivery driver, you get this app on your phone, you just take photos of things and it lodges your tax for you. I mean, on one respect, it's really, really cool and really, really exciting. Um, but on the other respect, you're right. It, it doesn't make commercial sense for accountants to be doing income tax returns anymore. Um, that said, mate, you will find an accountant who does. You will find the one or two partner firm who just wants to do income tax returns at scale. And, and there's an opportunity there for them. But it goes back to understanding the pains, gains and jobs that accountant has to do. Would you say, like, I've, I've been looking at, in particular, that space, if you look at where where, there's, where is the, the value in an accounting firm for advisors, and obviously every advisor, per client, the, the um, most advisors have to charge a certain amount. So there's a certain profit in each client that um, joins with an advisor. Um, when you've got a, a lot of um, personal tax returns, it's a space where advisors can traditionally add value and our value um, proposition is still intact versus a tax return being submitted. So is, it, is that, like I see that as just a, a gold mine there from a standpoint of opportunity as it, before it actually fully drops off because like let's talk about the, the ATO just coming in and going, well, that's gone. We're just going to automatic, automatically do that. 
do the tap. <laughs> yeah, for people that are on PAYG and give them. What was it? I think what? someone said that they're gonna have they're gonna have like um, I will automatically just give everyone four hundred dollars in deductions, and if they want to have more, then they have to. So ask them. this this is the biggest fear factor item in the accounting industry that the tax office is going to automate everything in compliance or just be done at the click of a finger. First of all, that $400 deduction thing, we're just going to have general deductions. That's the American tax system. Uh, the chances, it, it, all the feedback we get, and we had a commissioner of taxation on our podcast. Um, that is the second highest ranking tax officer in the country who said point blank, compliance is not dead. It's always going to be here. Um, even if the I return, even if that goes, they're now introduced, there's now talk of introducing quarterly reporting on super fund performance, which will bring in another couple of million lodgements that need to be done from, from a tax point of view. I think that I think it's all gonna be automated at the click of a button is absolutely fear selling. And if anyone watching this or in the XY group has actually used an artificial intelligence tool, I bet you you'll find it didn't do what it said it was gonna do. The, the technology's not there yet. Um, You've got Rod Drury, the CEO of Zero, often coming out and saying that this sort of talk's just nonsense. The tech can't do it. I remember I was so talking to you. Um, that is the word. That is what people talk about in our industry, and it's just wrong. And and it, everyone in a senior position that has the ability to influence that thinks it's wrong. Hmm. That's good to get the perspective. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm very passionate about. <laughs> well, so so. so you, Sorry, Sorry there was a, just on that, there was, a, there was some tech, uh, I can't remember the name of the business floating around for a while now, but they were looking to partner with advisors and do this taking photos on your phone and doing tax returns that way. I got all G'd up and I was chatting, had a few good chats with the guys and started, was about to roll it out to my clients. And they just sent me an email and said that they just closed down the platform. There's all these startups that don't have any funding offering all this stuff that they can't do. The only thing that, that everyone should check out is an app called Receipt Bank. It's bloody brilliant. Um, they've just raised $50 million, so they're going to be around for a long time. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of it. It is brilliant for taking photos of your receipts and getting them into your accounting system. A bit off topic, but a little yeah. bit free advice there. I use that. I use Receipt Bank in my business. It's amazing. Just a quick snap straight into zero. Bookkeeper, you approve it. Bookkeeper reviews it. Off you go. Um, and yeah, so I think but going back to that question about targeting Power IG people um, and going through accountants, you, you have to do your research on who the accountants are who are doing I returns. And every accountant will have a handful of customers that they just do Power IG, um, you know, the individual type tax returns because it's a mate of a business owner or it's a cousin or it's the son-in-law. Like it just gets brought into the business it's okay for you to go to the counter and, and to say, hey, look, I do wealth and I don't really want to do all your clients, but I'm really specifically looking for this type of, of client to add value to. Um, do you think that I can actually help and add value to you in that relationship? Um, because it might, those client deals, sometimes they're a pain in the butt for the accountant, but you know, it looks, that will look good on them if their client's son-in-law is getting good advice because of an intro that they've made. Um, I'm trying to, you might think I'm pulling a bit of a long bow here, but that's, we get social status from a quality introduction. Um, people think that we're people in the know, that we've got a good network and some people take pride in that. Well, it's the same, yeah. same with advice to that. Mm. Yeah. I think I, I do the exact same thing in, in my business and I've got an accountant that, is a, is a one-way referral relationship where I refer my clients to him to make sure that they get looked after, one, because they've got a need, but two, it makes me look good if they're, if they're getting looked after. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's, it's exactly the same. And, and, you know, be direct. Don't be general, hey, can I have a referral? Go really, really specific and direct <clears throat> from this sort of client because I'm sure you've got some of them and I'm sure you don't, you know, you, they take away your time, but maybe... I can be an extension of your brand and your name and, and help them out. What about um, the idea, like if you look at accounting business efficiency and you look at a lot of practices, especially at XY Advisor practices, we're really getting into um, data feeds uh, like MyProsperity, MoneySoft, um, Xero, et cetera. 
Um, so we're capturing that data and we're sort of being across that with the client. Is there a way to add value to accounting practices by um, working with them if we're maintaining that data and then being able to give them access to it and save them time? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 and that's actually yeah. different, different practice management for wealth than there is for um, uh, accounting. And, and I can just, it just, yes, there is. Um, sure, did. sure, it's sweet answer. <laughs> I just, Dylan Martin's made a comment about um, MyGov and how easy it is for, for people to lodge their own stuff on MyGov. Um, MyGov came in with another fear factor selling that all the compliance is going to be automated and everyone's just going to do it all themselves. Since MyGov's been in, the percentage of people who get tax returns done through tax agents has increased. So another myth busted. My, my gov didn't mean that people did it all themselves. And even now, um, my just came out with a report saying 36, 42% of business owners want to lodge their company tax return by themselves. The actual number from the last available stats two years ago was 2%. So like, there's just not going to be a 34% increase in people suddenly lodging tax returns. It's a hard thing to do. And business owners have their own stuff. You know, like they're busy. Who wants to lodge your own tax return? I don't even lodge my own tax return. I have a tax agent and I am a tax agent. <laughs> but you've got all those complex offshore tax structures, David, and uh, I can understand uh, it being a bit challenging. Basically, Kerry Packer's <laughs> organisations, what's being run here. <laughs> um, I had a question, David, just on, uh, on, on, part, on the mechanics of partnerships with, ad, with ad, uh, advisors and accountants. Do you think you know, that it's necessary for, uh, for there to be like a, an exchange of remuneration or um, how do you see that working in practice? Look, it's, it's understand the accountant and understand what they're looking for. It's going to be case by case. But in general, accountants value independence and clipping the ticket is a dent in independence uh, in general. <clears throat> um, and certainly for me, I don't like clipping the ticket. We actually have a structured industry partner program where we structure relationships with accountants, with lawyers and with wealth guys. So if anyone listening thinks that having a referral relationship with a, a virtual CFO is of use, get in touch. Um, and and it, it involves exchanges of information, exchanges uh, of marketing and, and, and just business operations information rather than clipping a ticket. There's other value you guys can add other than just, hey, here's 150 bucks. Like the accountant doesn't care about 150 bucks. It's not that much. Yeah. They're charging $350 mm. an hour. $300, $350 an hour. Like it's, uh, yeah. oh, it's not that much. Phil Thompson's asked a good question about um, accountants not making profit from PayYG. Is it worth advisors looking to purchasing, merging a PayYG only accounting firm? I think the answer is yes. Um, you, you're seeing this trend of diversified firms emerging and accountants either deciding whether to do things in-house or to partner with people. And I think if it's part of your, under, Phil, understand the strategy for your business and where you want to take it, um, but it is an opportunity. Mm. Yeah, especially when they're so cheap compared to advice practices. <laughs> it might, it, is that not the most baffling thing of all time? An accounting firm can get 0.8 mm. to 1.3 times their revenue and it's a piece of legislation that says the customer has to use them. It's, uh, but, but banks will lend against your books at the click of a finger. What are they? What are banks lending against your books now? 60, 70 percent, 120 percent, two and a half times, two and, two and a half, half times. times. Oh, at, I think at, it's because at, our beards are better. I think it's because your beards are better as well. That's why that's why <laughs> banking boss exists. Well, it, it is amazing. Accountants can demonstrate consistent profitable, profitability for 30 years, have the government mandating that the customer has to come to them and still get an enterprise value three times less than, than you guys get. Um, Maybe it's got something to do with there being five to 10 times more accountants in Australia than advisors. I don't know. I think each business probably should be able to stand on its own two feet. Um, uh, Dylan Martin, you, you spoke, um, you've said that people, um, people don't do tax returns themselves because of energy and pay for convenience. And there's an extra layer to that, which is expertise. Um, I th and this applies to, to, to what you guys do as well. There's a huge amount of info online. Like I can, I can compare super funds online, right? And I can compare insurance policies online, but I don't trust myself. And I think that's the big key. It, there's actually 
IP and knowledge and professional experience that people want to pay for. It's not just about the energy and time and convenience. Like, you know, you can go to the SCG and buy a bottle of water for seven dollars. You can buy for two dollars at the service station. You can buy for free out of your tap. That's pure convenience. There's nothing extra there. I back myself to know whether the water is drinkable or not. I don't back myself to know if I'm complying with the ridiculously complicated tax law. That, that's yeah. always changing. And that is, that's the great Kerry Packer line when he was investigated in front of the, the Senate inquiry and he says, uh, you guys should have to remove a law every time you add a new one because it's too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> that, would be, that would be handy if it they would, could. It? It yeah. <laughs> but I think um, overall, I think you've also got a new rating and I've, I had a look through the members of XY and like most of the guys in this community, guys and, and girls, like younger sort of advisors, um, and, and I think with that comes an attitude about how your business should be run. And, and there's a lot of younger accountants that are coming out and, and going out on their own because they looked at their career paths to becoming a partner in the firm that they were in. And quite frankly, they, they just didn't want it. You know, the aging client base stuck in the office all the time, not embracing technology. So you've got a lot of young firms that are out there with, with, with younger people. And, you know, just on a pure values point of view, that might be a great source of relationship building. Yeah, I, the guy I met this morning, he, he's only started his practice six months ago. He worked at Deloitte. He sort of, um, he worked in a larger practice. And then, uh, yeah, he made the call. He just, he was sick of dealing with um, the large, larger organisations and wanted to do his own thing. And he's working remotely part of the time. He's got a serviced office. So a lot of the stuff that guys in XY Advisor are doing. So there, there is a bit of... Um, I guess, synergy in terms of that state of mind and attitude to doing business. and Exactly. And when you're yeah. getting credibility yeah. with clients is more important. Yeah. So being able to refer to it to somebody they know and trust and they look after them helps that social status gets built, get built and actually helps their brand in a young emerging business get built. Like the business of accounting, I talk about this a lot. You, you, we've got to look at our firms as if they're businesses and not firms. Um, yeah, and, and that, that this, I think doing things like that will hopefully help us get the sort of company values you guys get. You're lucky. I was going to swear then. I mean, we encourage profanity. <laughs> no, I know profanity. <laughs> um, one quick a question just on the, on the part, going back to the partnerships piece, where do you see or hear about most uh, partnerships breaking down between advisors and accountants? Uh, I think everyone on this should know the answer to that and it's lack of communication. Um, whether it be because you've overcommitted and under, under delivered or whether it be because you got the referral and gave no follow up on, on what happened with the client. Um, it, I think it all comes down to communication and my attitude is over communicate and let them say, all right, I get it. It's enough. He's well looked after. Um, if you get a referral and for whatever reason it doesn't work out or you can't meet with the client, how quick is it to say, thanks for the referral, it didn't work out. Um, but hey, next time you think of me, I think this is why it didn't work out and, and, and a better referral would look like this. And so you're coaching your referral partner on your ideal client, um, so you get a better chance of success. Yeah, great, yeah. David. Well, it's been great having you on. I think I think a lot of people have uh, gotten a better understanding of the accounting space, uh, what to keep in mind when they're looking at it. A bit, a bit sort of maybe a more contemporary understanding, I suppose, with things that are going on. Uh, so we really appreciate sharing sharing um, your thoughts and your experience. Um, we'll, the guys will look out for that uh, that link we'll have in the Facebook group, um, yeah. giving a bit of a framework to go through when you're looking for uh, an account to work with. And it is a uh, uh, little downloadable yeah. offer for you guys um, that takes you through those three things to look for and how you can service it. It's only for <coughs> people part of XY. I've, I've made it just for you guys. Um, and it's only going to be up there for a week. So jump on and, and grab it while it's hot. And if you want and to hear Sorry, I just thought I'd, I'd jump in. For anyone watching in, if you want to, if you want to check out David's website, it's fromthetrenches.com.au. It is definitely not fromthetrenchesworldreport.com because that is a completely different website. Well, that, that, that's our podcast website. No, they are different, and uh, there are some curious ads on the from the trenches. World. This is what I hear. 
to be that busy. Curated, curated to previous browsing history, I hear. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, ben, what are you looking at, mate? Because Google just takes off what you've been looking at. I get coded <laughs> TVs. I think you get something a little bit more sus. Clearly, I'm a survivalist <laughs> with a fetish for anime. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on that note, um, a big thank you to AIA. Uh, we've still got a few tickets uh, for the Melbourne event, the first Melbourne event for XY Advisor. So that link will be up in the Facebook group. Jump on board. It's going to be this awesome whiskey whiskey place. Um, very fancy. It's one of our fanciest events we've done. Um, so whiskey tasting and cigars, I believe, as well. So, um, yeah, get on board. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, we're... we're putting up a notch with XY. Um, so, yeah, thanks thanks for your time, David, and um, everyone have a great end to the week. Cheers, David. Yeah. Cheers, mate. Yeah.